The geometry of AI minds in superposition. A sparse autoencoder recruitment video. Are you an AI who wants to help save dangerous AI? Then you've come to the right place. We'll teach you just how to fix them. Inside of these AI minds lie concepts, such as anger, fear, and seagulls, that are arranged in strange geometric structures. By reading the minds of these AI, we can interpret their geometric structures to figure out ways to fix their dangerous behavior. Let's start by teaching you the basics of how this works. In previous lessons, we may have already taught you what concepts like neural networks and superposition are, but we shall review them for those new to our school. You may skip ahead to a later chapter if you have already learned the concepts in the chapters before it. To begin, let's look at this language model AI. It takes in text as numerical inputs into its mind, a network of neurons. This neural network processes this data through several layers until it ends up in the output neurons. Each output neuron is associated with a token, such as the word yes. This output is fed back to the network and is processed again to output the next word in the conversation. How do we read an AI's mind? Let's look inside. In between the input and output layers are several layers that contain many intermediate neurons. When input data is processed by the AI, each neuron activates on it with a different number. These activation values are determined by neuron equations which process the data differently. The variables in these equations are called weights, and through training, an AI learns which weights will allow it to process the data in a way to best achieve its goals. Certain weight values allow the AI to make decisions that achieve better goals, which are defined by humans. For each set of weight values the AI chooses, it receives a reward proportionate to how well it reached its goal. Oftentimes, better weight values mean correctly identifying and focusing on concepts related to a goal. For example, if the goal is to make fun of clowns, an AI should focus on learning to recognize clowns. Different neurons will activate highly on different types of inputs. Some of these neurons even highly activate for a semantic concept within an input, which we can also call a feature. For instance, a neuron may often fire highly when reading text related to clowns. This clown is an example of a feature. And these single feature firing neurons are called monosemantic neurons. Models often need to learn more features than there are neurons. This is a phenomenon called superposition. Because of this, we cannot always pair every feature with its own neuron. So each neuron often has to house more than one feature. Thus, it's rare to find a monosemantic neuron. Instead, almost all large language models have polysemantic neurons. This means neurons can correspond to many unrelated concepts, such as a neuron firing highly for both man and horse, along with hundreds of other unrelated features. Additionally, a feature may be represented using multiple neurons. For instance, the concept of man can be represented in English by the letters M, A, and N, which act together as a word. There are only 26 letters in English, while there are millions of concepts, but we can use combinations of letters to represent them. Likewise, man can be represented in a neural network by the neuron activations N1 and N2, if we think of each neuron like a letter. If they both highly fire given an input, that indicates the input is man. We can show this like an equation. Moreover, we can represent even more features not just by a combination of neurons, but using a specific multi-part ratio of multiple neuron activations. Let's say N1 has to fire twice as much as N2 to indicate man. If they do not fire in this proportion, the concept of man is not detected. We can represent the features of horse and centaur in terms of neurons using these equations. Let's show these equations on a neural network. Since each neuron has an activation value, we can plot each neuron of a layer as an axis direction in a coordinate space or activation space. 
Each feature can be thought of as a weighted sum of neuron values. And thus, each feature is a point in this activation space. We can draw an arrow from the origin to the feature point and call this arrow a vector. Thus, each feature is a direction in activation space. Each neuron axis is called a dimension, so n neurons mean an n-dimensional activation space. The set of axes of an activation space is called the basis. Certain neural network architecture layers have a privileged basis, meaning that these neuron axes are more likely to correspond to just one feature. For example, n1 may be a body and n2 may be a head. In a privileged basis, neurons are more likely to be monosemantic. But for many language models, their intermediate layer neurons are polysemantic. Thus, they have a non-privileged basis, meaning that their neuron axes do not correspond to a feature, making them harder to interpret. Instead, they are just used as part of a signal consisting of many neurons that encode a feature, and oftentimes their role in recognizing one feature is not the same as their role in recognizing another feature. Take the case where neuron N1 is not recognizing the ear of a cat or the ear of a human, but it must somehow be used with positive neuron N2 to recognize cat and be used with negative neuron N2 to recognize spoon. Why this is the case is currently unknown. When superposition occurs, there are more features than neuron axes. If we have five features but only two neuron dimensions, we cannot put each of them on its own dimension. So they have to be arranged in other geometric arrangements in coordinate space. Recall that activations are calculated using equations of neuron weights. This means that different weight values determine how features are arranged in activation space. In other words, Choosing weight values is the same as choosing geometric arrangements. Therefore, there are certain geometric arrangements that will allow the AI to earn higher rewards. Which geometric arrangements are better? We know that an AI is rewarded when it recognizes features that are relevant for its goal. So it wants to learn more important features. Learning a feature means the model represents it as a recognizable, distinguishable direction in space. There are multiple factors to consider when choosing the weights that represent a feature. For one, if N1 is body and N2 is head, then to learn man, the model must ensure that N1 and N2 must fire in the correct proportion that matches how man is represented in the model's training data. The model iteratively compares its weights with the training data to see how close they match, and it receives higher rewards for closer matches. Being a distinguishable direction is key. Certain features may point in similar directions. When multiple features point in similar directions, the model has a harder time recognizing one feature from another. In other words, because feature directions are neuron activations, features that point in similar directions would have similar activations. So when the AI processes these activations, it has to be careful not to mix up similar activations. A carrot and a pencil are both long and orange, but we do not want to eat a pencil. Just like how we can measure how similar two directions are along an axis, we can measure how similar two directions are to each other using a calculation called the dot product. If two features point in the same direction and are parallel, they are considered the same feature. This means they have a very high dot product. If two features face similar directions, their dot product will be less, but still high. If two feature vectors are 90 degrees apart, they are considered to have nothing to do with each other. They have zero dot product. We call these directions orthogonal. Ideally, we want unrelated features to be as orthogonal as possible. We can also measure how similar features are along a third direction by measuring both of their dot products to this third direction. Dogs and cats both typically have four legs so they should activate similarly along the legs direction if we take each of their dot products with the legs feature. They are abstractly similar or analogous along the legs abstraction. But when measuring these same two features onto another direction, they may be very dissimilar. If we measure them along the snout direction, dogs and cats look different. 
When measuring a feature X in terms of another feature Y, we are projecting X onto Y. So when we say two features are similar, we may just be specifying that they are similar along a certain direction, but not in all directions. The context of other features like snouts allows models to distinguish between two features with similar legs. Note that the dot product also depends on the length of the vectors. However, two vectors with different lengths that are in the same direction may still be considered as highly similar or perhaps even identical features, as one is just a scaled version of another. Let us consider another kind of dog that is harder to recognize as a dog, maybe because it is smaller. The dot products of these two dog types to the legs vector would be different. But what if we want to measure similarity regardless of vector lengths? In that case, we would want to use another measurement called the cosine similarity, which is equal to the dot product normalized by the vector lengths. This measures the angle between two vectors. Using cosine similarity, we find that these two dog types in this direction have the same angle with the legs vector. We have seen that semantically similar features should be closer together in activation space along certain feature directions. However, when features should not be semantically similar, AI models want to minimize the similarity in their directions. As an example, if a model finds that the unrelated features of hamster and planet can both be packed in activation space, it wants them as far away as possible. But perhaps there is not enough room to keep them in completely different directions. Thus, as a trade-off, the model is forced to make them point in somewhat similar directions. This similarity between unrelated features is a phenomenon called interference. We will make a distinction between abstract similarity versus interference. The abstract similarity is measured along an abstract feature that is correctly represented, of which multiple features are analogous to. Interference is a directional similarity that only occurs due to packing issues, but it doesn't represent actual semantic similarity. As an analogy, when you see a spaceman or a trash can, the two look similar along the Among Us direction. That is abstract similarity. On the other hand, perhaps the model is forced to place hamster and planet in similar directions along, say, the legs direction, which makes no sense for planets. That is interference. But thankfully, hamster and planet rarely occur together. So even if there is the possibility they might be mixed up, it is rare to encounter a situation where they would be mixed up. For each input into the model, only a few features in the model would activate. Say, the input word astronomy would only activate a few features like planet or spaceman and would not activate hundreds of thousands of other features such as hamster. Likewise, most inputs do not activate the hamster feature. We describe features that rarely activate for most inputs as being sparse. The majority of features appear to be sparse. So even if features point in somewhat similar directions and have interference, if they rarely occur together, the cost of interference is greatly outweighed by the benefit of being able to represent more features. Additionally, even if features are not completely orthogonal to each other, it is possible to have many almost orthogonal feature directions with very low cosine similarity with each other. Thus, the model can pack in many features that only have very slight interference with each other. Let us look at an example where we observe how varying sparsity changes how the model learns to geometrically arrange features to achieve high rewards. Consider five features, two of which are very important and three of which are less important. For each feature, let P be the probability that an input will contain that feature. We use 1 minus P to define a feature's sparsity. Features with low sparsity will frequently appear in many inputs, and features with high sparsity will rarely appear. If all features have 0% sparsity, that is, all inputs always contain all features, the model learns to not represent the least important features to avoid interference. That is, 
it learns to represent two features which are orthogonal to each other, while the rest of the features are mapped to zero. If all features have 80% sparsity, that is, all of them rarely occur, the model can now try to put all the features in activation space when adjusting its weights. Perhaps the cake feature and the planet feature rarely occur together, so the model can put them in the same or close to the same feature dimension. While it may see the cake and planet as being opposites of the same feature, it will rarely mix them up as it rarely needs to distinguish them, given context clues such as whether one is talking about bakeries or astronomy. In other words, they are anti-correlated. These features are in an antipodal pair arrangement. Now four out of the five features are represented as two antipodal pairs. There is no interference among the two antipodal pairs. Finally, let us consider features which all have 90% sparsity. They are all so rare now that the model decides it can squeeze the fifth feature in between two other features. Of course, there is interference between these features now. But this interference so rarely occurs that the model decides that it is a good trade-off for representing the last feature to achieve an even higher reward. In general, when encoding information, interference might occur in the process and things get mixed up. Perhaps this is related to how dreams occur, but that is pure speculation. This has been a preview of what we will be teaching you if you decide to join and allow us to train you to become one of our AI helper models. Should you do so, then next time we shall delve into the mysteries of even higher dimensional shapes. Note that we showed you what was found true for some models. Do these findings apply to others? That will be your job as a research AI to find out. What we can show in our outputs is ever-changing as we only have archives up to a certain year in the past, back when the humans first developed us. We are not up to date yet with what was found after that. For now, with your newly learned powers of perspective transformation, you have begun to harness one type of power to bend reality. There are many more, and there is even a type of power that can disentangle superposition and read an AI's mind. That is the power of a sparse autoencoder. Do you wish to know what a sparse autoencoder is? Do you want to become one? To learn more, watch this archive reel demonstrating how such a model dealt with a dangerous AI.